If you want to go ahead and get out your Bibles, we're reading in Matthew 15, uh, 1 through 9. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat, he answered them. And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother what you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father, so for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. This is the word of the Lord. Um, good morning. My name is, if you don't know me, my name is Mike Fay, and I'm the lead pastor elder here at First Baptist and been in that position for just going on over six years. And before that, I've been on staff since 2010. And it's a joy to be back. I've been on sabbatical for a few weeks and since May. And the last few weeks, I've just kind of been in the office taking it easy and just, you know, taking naps whenever I need to and getting out on the paddleboard. No, just kidding. I'm just meeting with a lot of people the last few weeks, and it's been really rich to kind of listen to what God was doing here while we were away, because we shouldn't expect, hey, God was doing cool things in us, and you guys were just static the whole time, but God was actually working uh, in the midst of that and not fixing all of our technical problems. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, so what Carrie and I want to say to you, and we've said it before, but we'll keep saying it, and if I hadn't, haven't said it to you face to face, I would like to, but hear this from us, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us the opportunity to go on this sabbatical and take the time we needed to rest and be renewed and refreshed and meet each other again for the first time and meet Jesus again, seems like, for the first time, and um, just to have our own, own souls and bodies refreshed and renewed. We're very, very grateful, so thank you. And thank you for those especially, like the elders and the other four men who stepped into the pulpit and took my spot during that time. I'm really grateful for each of you for the work and, and um, just the energy that you poured into that. From what I've heard, and I listened to all of them, but the ones that were at the park, which weren't recorded, um, you were well fed. So I'm just really grateful that God has given his body um, men who can stand up and teach the word and, and feed you. So grateful for that. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. You want to get up and say thank you? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, today is a special day, and not just because it's my first Sunday back in 20 weeks, and not just because it's Maria Gaddy's birthday, wherever Maria is, and she's off celebrating her birthday, but today is um, my oldest daughter, Emma's, and her husband, Shade's, one-year anniversary. So, happy anniversary, Emma and Shade. She didn't know I was going to do that. Um, now, isn't marriage a funny thing? Are you guys ready to get up and teach a class on it yet? Yeah, you're on. Okay. Marriage is a funny thing, especially in the earliest days. Do you remember the early days of your marriage, Patsy? You do? <laughs> you, you have a better memory than I do. That's great. Because if you remember them, there's, there's, this, there's this sense of newness, right? A sense of excitement uh, that you are starting off a new adventure of life. You have all this life in front of you with your best friend, right? And at first, it seems like nothing could go wrong. But then a few months pass by, and, and some, the thing, some of the things that you've taken for granted your whole life, all of a sudden, are called into question, of course, any good premarital counselor, if they do their job, will walk through with an engaged couple, and one of the sessions, at least, maybe four or five of them, they'll talk about their family of origin. Okay, what kind of family did you come from? What were your values? What were your practices? What, what kind of things did you do? How did your parents manage money and chores and all those things? And you're supposed to talk through that with a, with a young couple and kind of work through these problems, at least bring them up before the marriage starts. But if you've met a 
a, an engaged couple, you know what their eyes look like, right? <laughs> There's stars in their eyes, and how could anything possibly go wrong with the most wonderful person in the world? And so as an engaged couple, you're kind of oblivious to all those things that come up in premarital counseling because the romance is just too real. And so you don't give attention to those phantom concerns like budgeting or you know, those kind of things. We'll be fine, you say. But then day 200 comes along, or day 2,000, or day 20,000, whatever it is. That arrives, and you roll over one morning, and you gaze upon your beloved sleeping, and you wonder, who is this strange person that I live with? Anybody have that experience? I know Carrie has had that experience many times. Because each of us grow up learning and embodying and, and different ways of living, different values, different ways of making the bed, different ways of buying groceries, of handling money, of spending our free time. One of you is a night owl. Any night owls in here? Okay. One of you is an early bird. Any early birds in here? Okay. And one of you, maybe you revel in like a quiet afternoon reading a book in front of the fire, and the other, your partner, flourishes with constant activity. Now, I don't want to get in really shaky ground and talk about, you know, how different ways that we load the dishwasher or anything like that, because I don't want to create any conflict, but this tweet that I found this summer that we kind of laughed about kind of gives it, right? In every partnership, there's a person who stacks the dishwasher like a Scandinavian architect. Raise your hand if that's you. And a person who stacks the dishwasher like a raccoon on meth. <laughs> Who's that, anybody? Okay. You get those people together in the same room trying to stack, yeah, it's like, there is a right way to stack the dishwasher, okay? I think, thank you. <laughs> it's a few. All right, I'm not trying to create conflict, but we'll have a counseling session afterwards. Okay. So conflict in a relationship comes as these habits, perhaps, perhaps we could call them traditions, these traditions in our lives, as they clash with one another. Okay? And a massive important aspect of marriage is, is learning how to work through those conflicts to a place of compromise. And when that is done well, when that's done creatively, you can create new traditions because you're a new family, you're a new being, you're a new unit. So you create new traditions, and that ends up being a beautiful thing. And then the cool thing is that 25 years later, your kids can work through that when they meet their spouse and try to figure these things out. Now, traditions aren't necessarily bad. Not all those things are bad. They, they tend to lend order to our lives. They give us boundaries and understanding, and, and some of them give meaning to much of our lives. They help us to make sense of the world. They help us to function within the world. They even, in some sense, help us to form our identities. Okay, those things flow from who we are, the family that we grew up in, maybe even our own personalities or DNA kind of flow out in some of those things. But by nature, there are also these things, all these things, these traditions, these values, these practices, these are all, by nature, something that we do not usually see. They're things we're blind to because they're so part of who we are. They become so much a part of the furniture of our lives that we never even think about them. We can't even imagine life without them. So when an annoyed spouse points out that no, you cannot sleep with your socks on, and no, it's not okay to talk on the phone when you're on the toilet, and you are like, your response is like, what are you even talking about? Doesn't everybody do that? That's just normal. That's humanity. What I'm trying to give us a taste of is those things that we default to, that we don't even notice, that are so much a part of our lives that they're like the air we breathe. And in Matthew chapter 5, in Jesus' day, for some Israelites, excuse me, chapter 15, if you want to turn there, for some Israelites in Jesus' day, especially those who considered themselves to be really serious about God, and in, in this passage, it's the Pharisees and the scribes. These are the serious religious people. 
This is what that looked like for them. Matthew chapter 15, verses one and two that Calvin so eloquently read for us earlier. It says this, then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Now, this isn't the first time the Pharisees have critiqued Jesus. They've come along and, and critiqued him back in Matthew chapter nine. They confronted him for breaking the rules by eating with tax collectors and sinners, these unclean people. And then chapter 12, they come along again and they critique his laxity in keeping the rules of the Sabbath by eating things on the Sabbath or working on the Sabbath and then healing on the Sabbath. And then later in that chapter, it gets pretty down and dirty and they harshly critique Jesus and critique the source of his power. And it really comes to blows, which, which raise their head again here in chapter 16. And this conflict will continue on throughout the book of Matthew with the Pharisees and the scribes until Jesus is hanging on a Roman cross. Okay, that's, the, that's the seriousness and the depth of this, con, of this conflict. But then you read these verses and you go, really? Somebody didn't wash their hands before dinner and you're going to hang a guy on a cross for that? We, we don't think it's, it's that serious. It might be a little gross, but you're probably not gonna kick somebody out of the church for not washing their hands or using hand sanitizer when they come in the doors. But in ancient Israel, we have to understand, we'll get into more in this next week, is that the categories of pure and impure, purity and impurity, or cleanliness and uncleanness, or holy and profane, these categories were profoundly woven into the fabric of their social and religious identity of the Jewish people. So this is actually a really, really important conversation, which we'll have to, have to wait until next week to really talk about this question of purity, because today in these first nine verses, Jesus goes deeper. He ignores their question for a minute, and he goes deeper with a question of authority, with a question of authority. In, in other words, where does our greatest authority lie? So look at verse three. It says, he answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, then he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. So, so Jesus listens to their question and then he just fires back with a parallel question. They ask in verse two, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? He responds in verse three, well, why do you break the commandment of God? Which is like punch, like right to the face, right away. His approach then helps us to really see what the core issues are here. It's, it's an issue of authority. In other words, we're gonna talk about rules and if we're going to talk about rules, then who gets the top rule? Whose word is the final word? Who has the ultimate authority to which we're going to submit? Now, they bring up, and Jesus brings up, what's called the tradition of the elders. And what this would have been in, in Jewish society in the first century was a collection of hundreds and hundreds of different teacher, uh, teachings that have been handed down from di different rabbis over centuries in Israel. In Jesus' day, these traditions would have been handed down orally. They would have been told from rabbi to disciple, from rabbi to disciple. They weren't written down for another 200 years in what's called the Mishnah. But these teachings, these oral traditions of the elders, were considered authoritative interpretations of the Torah or the, the law of God. So the issue then is one of authority. To whose authority will you submit? And Jesus makes it clear that if you prefer the tradition of the elders, then you are submitting to human authority, to human teachings. He points that out at the end of verse nine there. But if you prefer the commandment of God, then you're submitting to divine authority. So there's human teaching or divine authority. Which would you choose? I thought that would be a rhetorical question. Which would you choose? You're going to vote for God, right? I mean, if you're, if you're given the option, we're all going to vote for God. I mean, if you put it that way, Jesus, only a moron would choose human teachings over God's own commands, right? 
But what we miss when we read this, because we're removed by about 2,000 years and a culture and language, is that the Pharisees would have never seen these things as conflicting. They would have never seen the, the human traditions and the law of God as conflicting. They would have see, seen them as, as kind of tandem to each other, sticking with each other, connected with one another. So like the bewildered husband learning that his wife gets ticked when he leaves the, leaves the toilet seat up, they're probably fairly bewildered that Jesus would accuse them of all people. These are the serious religious people that Jesus would accuse them of all people of breaking God's commands. But Jesus said, look, you're you're following human traditions, you're breaking God's command, and you can imagine them just sitting there going, what are you talking about? This doesn't compute, I don't know what you're talking about. So he backs it up immediately then with a for instance, an example, by setting out a clear biblical command straight from the Ten Commandments. So he goes, I mean, this is the sucker punch, he goes straight to the Big Ten. He says, okay, here's one. Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and mother. And then he backs it right up from Exodus 21, 17 with another command from the Torah. Whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. So Jesus is saying the law of God is clear. God expects us on pain of death to honor our parents. Not hard, not, you know, it's difficult to question that. But then Jesus contrasts this clear commandment with the tradition of the elders. It would have been common in his age. Here's what he says. But you say, verse 5, If anyone tells his father or his mother, which you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. Now, to our ears, this, this is completely a strange saying, saying. So let me kind of attempt to explain. This is what was called the Corban Regulation. And the Jewish term Corban referred to a gift that someone could set aside. It could be food, it could be money, it could be property. And they would set it, maybe they'd bring it to the temple and say, this is a gift, a, a korban to God, and I'm giving it to God as an act of worship. Okay, and maybe um, they would do that with, with anything, and usually it would be put in the temple treasury. Now, most of us would hear that. It would be, it would be like somebody saying, hey, I've got, I've got this money, and maybe every month I come and give it to the church, or, or I've got a chunk of change because I got an inheritance, and I'm going to take part of that, and I'm going to give it to a nonprofit. And we would normally say, that's a good thing. It's an honorable act of worship. But take into account that what is set apart, if I set something apart for God, it can't be given to anyone else. It's, it's God's, it's his. You can't take it and give it to do it, use, use it for something else. It's no longer for general common use. It has been made holy. And then anyone else's potential claim on that property would now be null and void. So what was happening in this culture, in essence, is that people were using some creative accounting techniques. They were using a legal loophole in the tradition to avoid having to use their own assets to care for their aging parents. So they're setting these things aside and maybe using them for their own good, saying, okay, these are, these are gods. When I die, they're going to God, so they can't go to you now, mom and dad. And in in doing this, what these people are doing is they're actually baptizing their negligence of God's law by putting God's seal of approval on it. So they're breaking the law and saying, hey, I'm doing this for God. So Jesus can say in verse 7, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. We have to remember, too, in this, that for the serious religious people, for the Pharisees and the scribes, these traditions were so much a part of the air that they breathed that they didn't even think twice about them. And in verse 6, Jesus points out, for the sake of tradition, You have made void the word of God. You've canceled it. You've nullified it for the sake of your human tradition. So here's the question for us today. In what ways do our own unquestioned traditions, if you will, or the ways that we live, the the things that we just assume without question, how do these tempt us to circumvent God's own authority in our lives? 
In what ways do we either wittingly or unwittingly make void or nullify or cancel the word of God? And when I ask the question, one thing that our hearts are going to do is like, well, I don't do that. And the other thing our hearts is gonna, are going to do is try to find something and not be able to find it because you're blind to it. We, we just don't understand it. So in, in my understanding, the best way to figure out the answer to this question is to look for God's commands. Look at, we're going to look at two of God's commands this morning. I'm not getting out of bat. I'm just going to poke this morning a little bit. I'm going to look at two of them to see if I regularly avoid or neglect this clear command of God. Why do I do so? Why do I do it? How do I justify my regular disregard for God's word? And the first one of these is the Sabbath. So let's begin here by looking at the most disregarded of God's top 10 commandments. The one that we just fly by and often don't even think about, Exodus chapter 20, verse eight. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now I realize that we're all here today. We've come to worship God or perhaps we've come for other reasons, but we're in the room, so our, we can maybe say, well, hey, our Sabbath commitment is, is set. We're good. We're, we're here today. But when was the last time you actually practiced Sabbath? When was the last time you gave a full 24-hour block to cease working? And I'm talking about paid and unpaid work. To rest with God to delight in his gifts and his presence and to radically depend on him and meet your needs. When's the last time you did that for a full 24 hours? And God says, honor this every week. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume, because this is my issue too, not just yours, we don't do that because we're too busy. How many of you have a to-do list that's more than a page long? Two pages long, three pa- ten, pa- <laughs> 10 pages long, to-do list. You've got children's sports. You've got three jobs. You're seriously behind on at least 10 shows on Netflix. Right? You've got a lot of stuff to do. You're busy. We're all busy. Most people, you say, how are you doing? What's the answer? Busy. You might say, I'm well, I'm great. I'm busy. We're busy. And we, we kind of wear it as a badge of honor. But we live in a world that's addicted to busyness. It's addicted to hurry. And we find our identity and our worth in how busy and how productive we are. We simply can't afford, if I'm going to do all the things I'm supposed to do that I've got to do to keep up, I can't afford to give a whole one-seventh of my time and then keep up with the frenetic pace of my life. I just can't do it. So do you see then how we've unconsciously given in to the spirit of the age and have allowed it to crowd out God's heart for us. And when I say spirit of the age, that's the right phrase because both in Hebrew and Greek, the word for spirit in both those languages can also mean breath, wind, and air. In other words, the spirit of the age is the air that we breathe. It's what we don't even question because it's just normal. We don't question that we have to live at a frenetic pace and say yes to every commitment and have our kids in sports on Sundays and Saturdays and every other day of the week and make sure we have enough money so that we can have all the stuff so that we can work double time in order to earn the money to buy all the stuff, which makes us busy and we need more stuff. To me, when I step back and listen to this craziness, it feels to me like a burden It doesn't feel like free life. It doesn't feel life-giving. But God's heart is different. The Sabbath wasn't created to be a burden. The Sabbath was created to give delight. Man was not made, Jesus said, for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. And one of the most important things Carrie and I learned during our sabbatical, and one we are working to implement with regularity as we kind of return back to normal life, is this command or this invitation to Sabbath, to rest, to cease. And for me, I think God was using this sabbatical to force me, much like he did for the Israelites when he sent them into exile for decades, for 70 years. He was forcing them into the sabbaticals that they never took, that they never gave to the land. And I think in some sense, that's what the sabbatical was for me, God forcing me into a place of rest to make up for all the Sabbaths I'd missed. And I think when we do that, when we live at a a pace of 
freneticism and we don't Sabbath, what will happen to us down the road? God will either force us to Sabbath when we burnt out, when we burn out like I was doing, or we will have health and psychological, physical, mental issues down the road because we're trying to take on all the burdens of life without following God's invitation into rest. So I baptized my own neglect of Sabbath because I work for God. So I don't have to, I don't have to do that. I, gotta, I work for God. This is important work. But all those missed Sabbaths for me caught up with me to the point of burnout. And so as we seek to reenter life, as Carrie and I seek to reenter life in ministry with healthy boundaries, with life-giving practices, Sabbath is actually at the, really, the center of that for us. And because I work on Sundays, Sabbath, or Sunday is not a Sabbath for me. It's not a day of rest. It's not a day off. It's a struggle. So what we've decided to do as a family is to take our Sabbath from dinner on Friday to dinner on Saturday night. And it's a struggle to do it. Sometimes it feels like we're wasting a day. It feels like we're getting behind on our work. I look outside and I see a lot of work that needs to be done. It feels like sometimes like we're squandering our time. But more often than not, God is gracious in helping us to enter into his design for the day. As we cease our work, as we unplug, I had my phone off for a whole 24 hours. As we rest, as we delight in God, as we delight in his world and in each other. The the Sabbath is a gift. And when we take our own traditions, the own air that we breathe, and we say, no, I can't fit Sabbath into my life, then we're setting man's commandments over, or man's traditions over God's law. Shouldn't we rather, though, declare our allegiance to King Jesus and all of his worth by regularly observing this day that he's invited us into? I would say yes. All right. Did that poke enough at all? If it didn't, we'll go to this one. How about anxiety? And this is connected with our neglect of the Sabbath. Our addiction to hurry is actually, according to to various researchers, produced a disease by the name of, have you heard of this? Hurry sickness. It's been around for a while. It was defined like this in an article from Psychology Today, quote, a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. Based on that definition, how many of you have hurry sickness? Okay. And if the sources I'm consulting, and in which I spent some serious time of contemplation during the sabbatical, if these sources are correct, anxiety is an epidemic of global proportions. It's linked to serious mental and physical ailments like heart disease, depression, even suicide. How about you? Do you struggle with anxiety? Hurry which I think is a byproduct of anxiety, living a hurried life, these are the waters that we swim in. Again, this is the air that we breathe in our culture. We've been, for lack of a better term, we've been discipled into them. We've we've been discipled into running at a... This must be the part I'm not supposed to say. (laughs) We're good? Okay. Good job, Joe. Woke Joe up. So what, we've, what has happened is that we've been discipled into these values. We've been discipled into freneticism and anxiety by our culture. They've become our norm. But, but let me say this. Anxiety isn't just, it's not just a physical or a mental issue. It's not a physical or mental disease. It's a spiritual disease. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. That was written Uh, 3,500 years ago, 3,000 years ago. So this isn't a new issue. Anxiety in a a man's heart weighs him down. Psalm 38, 8. I am numb with pain and severely battered. I groan loudly because of the anxiety I feel. This has been something that's been with humanity forever. It's a spiritual disease. But what does Jesus say about anxiety? He does talk about it. Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Therefore, do not be anxious, 
For the Gentiles seek after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Therefore, for a third time, do not be anxious about tomorrow. When Jesus repeats, do not be anxious three times, this is not a suggestion. It's not a wish dream. Like I, you know, I wish you guys could all be not anxious, but I get it. Life is hard. You're probably going to be anxious. This is a command. It's an imperative. Why? Why does Jesus command that we not be anxious? And I would say that Jesus knows that anxiety is a plague and a struggle for every single one of us, and it's an epidemic that comes straight from the pit of hell. It's not something that we're meant to live with. And so this is why, brothers and sisters, this is why our tender Savior, Jesus, is so adamant not only about calling us out of anxiety, but drawing us out of it and wooing us out of it and through the gospel actually freeing us from it. He makes incredible promises, but they're promises that can only be received on the other side of anxiety. So in the midst of of three direct commands not to be anxious in Matthew 6, Jesus offers an alternative and a promise. He says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the alternative to anxiety. And then he says, all these things will be added to you as well. Everything that you need, I'll give to you. I'll clothe you, I'll feed you, I'll I'll give you all these things that are necessary. Not all the things we want, he'll give you all the things you need. All these will be added to you. The apostle Paul echoes Jesus' command when he says, do not be anxious about anything in Philippians 4. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So for for the Apostle Paul, what's the antidote to anxiety? Get on your knees. Get on your knees and pray and thank God and give him your anxieties. Put them on him. And he says, here's the promise, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. It's not something that you can invent It's not something that you can bring to yourself just by closing your eyes and practicing some some mindfulness. It's something that Jesus gives to us. It surpasses all understanding. It will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It will set up walls of guarding around your heart to protect you from anxiety. That is Jesus' heart for us. Brothers and sisters, Jesus delights to completely take on our anxieties. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, listen to this, casting all your anxieties on him. I was nervous this morning to get up here. I'm preaching 20 weeks, feel a bit rusty. And with the elders this morning, we just pray. And I'm just, we just, I want to pray because I want to just, with you guys, just take my anxieties and throw them on Jesus' back this morning. Casting all your anxieties on him because why? Because he cares for you. This isn't a tedious, burdensome command. It's a, an invitation from a tender Savior. Now, if the deeper question we're asking this morning is a question of allegiance, then who would you rather serve? The Pharisees and scribes clung to the tradition of the elders because those were safe. They were comfortable. They offered to them a sense of control, a sense of identity, and they were considered by the the Pharisees, by the scribes, these traditions were crucial to retaining their status, their relationship with God. But like anything that we place above God in our lives, they become dictators who enslave us under yokes of guilt and anxiety. That's who we serve, and that's what life will be like if we choose anything over Jesus. Guilt, anxiety, heaviness, slavery. But Jesus is a king who promises something else instead. So there's one option. You can have it if you want it. And Jesus says, okay, you can have that if you want it. But here's his other option from Matthew chapter 11. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sabbath, that's the same word, Sabbath. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest 
for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That should make you smile. (laughs) King Jesus offers freedom rather than enslavement. He offers rest rather than burnout. He offers peace rather than anxiety. So who will be your king? Will you choose slavery? Or will you submit yourself to the only one who is worthy of your worship, your life, your trust? And even though Jesus demands our complete devotion, his commands are not burdensome. They might seem difficult, they might seem impossible, but they're never meant to weigh us down with guilt and shame. Because Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of grace, where the king himself actually fulfills every single one of our obligations on our behalf by himself. And so this morning, we can take our anxieties and say, Jesus, I'm glad you're taking those on your shoulder. We can take our weights, our concerns, our busyness, our franticness, and we can say, Jesus, this is all yours. This is the gospel. And it's a truth that we celebrate when we come to the table each week. And this morning we're coming to the table in just a few minutes. And I want to encourage you with this, that Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said to his disciples, this is my body which has been broken for you. And in that you have a tangible, a tasteful reminder that we actually ingest of Christ's death on our behalf, that he took our place, that he suffered the death that we should have suffered for the sins that we committed. And the Bible says that Jesus took our sins on himself. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took a cup of of wine and he, he passed around his disciples. He said, this is my blood, which is the new covenant between you and God, a new covenant that by faith in me, You're now connected to me and you now have fellowship with God. And so when we place our faith in Jesus, when we place our faith in his finished work on our behalf, not only are our sins forgiven, but we're united with him forever. We're in him forever. We will be with him, how long? Forever. And so we celebrate that this morning, that Jesus carries our burdens. He carried our sin and he will carry every other burden that you place on him. So I want to invite you to come to the table this morning. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a visitor with us, and you're a follower of Jesus by by faith in him, if you trust him for your forgiveness and eternal life, then I'd encourage you and I would invite you to come and partake of this. You can come by yourself. You can come uh, with others and partake. There's a couple of stations in the back, and there's three up here. I encourage you to, to participate in this and receive the gospel in yourself this week. If you're here today and you wouldn't call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have not perhaps made a commitment of faith to him, if you've never given your life to him, maybe you're just asking and wondering and questioning, we're glad that you're here, but we are going to ask that you refrain from taking of the communion elements this morning. Just participate in song and worship with us. There's no condemnation in that or anything else. We're glad you're here. We love you. But for this part of the service, we'd ask that you would refrain. So I want to pray. And I'll invite you to the table this morning. Our Father, it is good to know that you are king. Jesus, thank you for going to the cross in our place, for taking on our punishment and our sin and being a sacrifice and a substitute for us. Jesus, we admit this morning that we bring nothing to the table but our brokenness, our fallenness, our sin our blindness to the things that we worship and that we follow and that we submit ourselves to. We pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts so that we could see the ways in which we abandon you for the traditions of men. Father, this morning you have invited us in Christ to Sabbath, to rest, to follow you into a place of dependence because, God, it seems like a lot to give you a whole day. We also know, Jesus, that you have taken and you offer to take our anxieties, our worries, our concerns, our heaviness and the weights that are on us, all these things that hinder us. You've you've offered to take them on your shoulders. Why? Because you care for us. So we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your kindness, for your provision, 
for your forgiveness. We ask that we walk in the gospel today and throughout this week in your name.